So we need to discuss how psychology, not really how it became a science, but what it means to think like a psychologist and therefore to think about psychology as a science. And this set of notes has, it's kind of molded to take on quite a few names, like more than common sense, but ultimately you're thinking critically with psychological science. And we'll talk about how using common sense, what we think is just, oh, that just makes sense, right? Everybody knows that is not always scientific and therefore not accurate. Hindsight bias is the first thing that we talk about to kind of prove that common sense is, just isn't psychological, it's not scientific. So hindsight bias is the I knew it all along phenomenon. So often we hear, when we hear or learn something, it seems familiar. So we think to ourselves, oh, I knew that all along, right? I, I don't remember a time that I didn't know that. And this is very apparent when you play games like Jeopardy and the person will buzz in and say the answer and you're like, <laughs> I totally knew that. I knew that even before they said it. I just didn't say it out loud, right? So that's hindsight as in looking back and having a bias toward it as if I knew it all along. Overconfidence is we tend to think we know more or can do more than we actually do or can do. So how long do you think it would take you to unscramble these words on the right-hand side here? People said it would take them 10 seconds, I got this. On average though, it took them three minutes. Okay, so um, we convince ourselves even after being proven wrong that our initial answer was almost right, right? We just have some overconfidence about our, our abilities and therefore we need science, we need the scientific thinking, the critical thinking um, in order to kind of get over this overconfidence and hindsight bias. There's also pseudoscience, the popular beliefs that seem to be related to science but aren't, so like astrology or star reading, um, psychics, etc. What's up? <gasps> Thanks. Did you read it? Yes, I was reading it walking up here. Isn't it good? <laughs> For the most part, I didn't get to finish. <laughs> it's okay. So these ideas seem to give insights into personality and future behaviors, like your horoscope, right? But they don't actually stand up to scientific studies or findings. Confirmation is another one, and it's actually not in the um, guided notes that I have for you, so you want to add this. This is when we are actively looking for and seeking information, but we only see, we only notice the evidence that proves our beliefs, while we ignore all other, all other evidence that disproves it. Okay, so we've got to somehow overcome the pitfalls of things, like overconfidence, hindsight bias, pseudoscience and even confirmation bias. We've got to overcome those. And the scientific attitude is how we go about that. And that's really taking yourself out of, not out of yourself, but out of that common sense, I know this, I'm good at this mentality, and taking on, okay, I must look at this scientifically. So it's composed of curiosity, a passion to explore, but also skepticism, doubting and questioning at every turn, and also humility, humbleness to accept when you are wrong. Like, okay, my common sense was wrong. It might be common, but that doesn't make it right. So critically, critical thinking does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions just because they're common or we assume they're right. It examines assumptions discerns hidden values, evaluates evidence, assesses conclusions, and it looks at them skeptically. So if you were given the statistic that said one in every three teenagers is predicted to be less intelligent than their older generations, right? Would you accept that? Because that's about you. I hope that you wouldn't be like, yeah, we're all dumb. No, no you're not, you're not dumb. And there is really no research that says this, but if it did, I hope that you would use some skepticism. Like, wait a second, where did this come from? I would like to kind of explore this and think about it critically. How did they find this, if this is the case? And that's you thinking critically. But also it might start the scientific method. So how do you know something is truth? How do you absolutely know when something is the absolute truth? And we could get very philosophical here. Psychologists, like all scientists, use the scientific method to construct theories that organize, summarize, simplify observations. That's how they make their money. They use the scientific method, they construct these theories, right? It's very systematic so that in the end something can be proven or disproved. Not simply this is common sense. It has to be sympathetic, or I'm sorry, it has to be systematic 
in order to cover all their bases, let's make sure that we're really covering this topic and can't be proved wrong when someone thinks of something else bigger or better or something to prove us wrong. And in the scientific method, they come upon a theory. It's an explanation that integrates principles, organizes, and predicts behaviors or events. Evolution is a theory. It's the closest thing that we can come to truth. It's highly researched, rigorously tested, and that organizes multiple studies under one umbrella of an idea. And it's tested and retested and tested and retested to a point where everybody's starting to jump, not everybody, but most everyone is jumping on board and saying, yes, this makes sense. I, I agree with this. This appears to be just about as close to truth as we can get. Evolution is a theory. It can change, right? And that all starts with the hypothesis, the testable prediction that often um, is induced by a theory to enable us to accept, reject, or revise the theory. It's a statement of relationship between or among variables, and it is always an if-then statement. So my hypothesis is, if I wear purple socks, then I will be happier. That would be a hypothesis that I could then go and test. I wear purple socks for a week, and then I measure my happiness, right? That would just be of me, though, so it's probably more of a case study than an experiment, which we'll talk about the difference between in a moment. Research observations. Um, so is the research being the application of a hypothesis through systematic observation and also manipulation of variables? And that's two different things that we'll talk about in more depth in the future. And it in turn supports or disproves a theory. But operational definitions are always required. It's the precise definitions of a variable being observed so that it is one measurable, and I want you to underline, circle, engrave that in your brain and on your paper, that an operational definition makes a variable measurable, but then also manageable. And I'm going to give you a chance here later to come up with some operational definitions for these variables. So if I say that purple socks, if I wear purple socks, then I will be happy, if that's my hypothesis, how am I going to measure the variable of happiness, right? Because I can assign two groups, you wear white socks, you wear purple socks. And I, as the researcher, how am I going to tell all of my people who are collecting the research, this is how you measure happiness? If I don't tell them the operational definition of happiness, which is how to measure it, they're not going to know how to go out and measure it. One guy's going to say, I'm going to count their smiles. Another person's going to go, I'm going to give them a survey where they self-report their levels of happiness. Another person's going to say, they have to do a cartwheel and back handspring in order for them to be happy. Right? That's not all the same thing. So therefore, it can't be used. You have to tell your people, your researchers, how to measure the variable. This is what allows for other scientists to replicate, meaning to redo, do over, do again, similar studies to further prove or disprove the theory. Because if it's going to become a theory, it's got to be researched and done over and over again, right? So this allows for scientists to replicate the study because they've been told this is how you measure the variable that we are looking for. That is absolutely huge to know about operational definitions. And this just kind of showing the research process, okay? So one is the theories, an example being low self-esteem feeds depression, which leads to a hypothesis. People with low self-esteem score higher on a depression scale. If someone has low self-esteem, then they are higher on the depression scale which leads to the research and observation. So we administer tests of self-esteem and, de and depression, and you see if a low scale, a low score on one predicts a high score on the other, which generates or refines the theory, and we go back to the hypothesis and back to the research and over and over and over again. Um, and that, re that really never ends. It really never ends, because will you ever truly get to truth? <laughs>